All right, looks like we're live. Awesome. So I'll just give a quick introduction. Um, Champion, I'm so glad to have you on Hannah's Corner. Thanks so much for joining us. For those of you who are watching and um, who are not yet perhaps familiar with Champion or perhaps are, um, she is a world-renowned jazz pianist and vocalist and um, 12 rec records known to her name. And she is quite prolific. She has toured and played at some of the hottest jazz clubs and festivals in North America and Europe and is very much a, um, well, Deserving artist, a Yamaha artist recently. Um, Sorry, hold on. We have a little bit of a technical problem <laughs> on my end. Um, but I think we're good. Sorry. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hannah. We're really glad to have Champion on here this corner. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. So, should I just play a little song to say hi? Why not? Let's do it. Um, this is one of the first songs I ever played in public, which was now quite a while ago. And um, this is a little... Every time it rains, it rains. Pennies from heaven. Don't you know each club contains pennies from heaven? You'll find your fortune falling. Absolutely gorgeous. 
I love that. I love your phrase. You you bring such a fresh energy. I think just when I hear you play and when people hear you play, there's you one cannot help but feel joyful. I think it's something that you exude when I first heard you and I'm new to your music. It just drew me in how joyful you are when you play and you have a natural ability to be able to kind of connect with the audience and kind of piano's on autopilot. You're doing your thing and you're you're looking at the audience and a lot of artists sometimes, you know, don't engage that way. They're absorbed maybe in their music or they're singing, but you have a real knack for doing both. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much. It's actually um, something I really worked on a lot when I was when I was younger, being able to, to look up and like look around. Um, but it's even more different. It's more different now that we're all doing so much with the screen. And it's like you're looking at the screen and it's really... Um, it's sort of more sterile, you know, it's like being in a recording studio. So like in the, in the club or in a, you know, on a gig, you're looking around, you see people, you see, you know, maybe like you see the bar and you see the tables and you see people. Um, but then here I just see like the screen and it's, it's really um, different, but I try really hard <laughs> to imagine, you know, and of course I can see you and that's great. But like when I do my other live streams, uh, like Facebook live, you know, of course you only see yourself. Right. It definitely is a challenge, but you make it look easy. <laughs> Thank you. How about we just talk a little bit about um, how you got into music, how you got started. Was was um, singing first for you? Was was piano first? How did that kind of come about, your story? I think, you know, my, my family's musical. My father plays trumpet and flugelhorn with me. He plays a lot with me on my Sunday shows. Um, and, you know, I was always around music, and, and I love to sing. I think kids love to sing all the time anyway. You know, you sing to your... I had a dog. I would sing to my dog. I would sing to my dolls. Um, and he really wanted me to be a musician, so I was studying piano. I studied trumpet. I studied drums. Um, but I really liked... Actually, I, I played trumpet all through high school, through school. Um, but I liked the piano because you could sing and play at the same time, and I really liked to do that. And we started working, uh, my band with my father, in Oklahoma, which is where I'm from. We started working uh, when I was around 12 years old out there. Um, so it was just something I'd always really wanted to do, and I started really early. Wow, yeah, I'll say. <laughs> so you're kind of a club pro, by the, you know, in your tween years. You were clubbing, you were <laughs> getting all that hands-on experience so early. Yeah, we did a lot. So we started out at Borders Books and Music. I don't know if everybody remembers Borders, but it was like a Barnes & Noble, and they had a cafe. Um, and we would play. We did a lot of um, brunch gigs. It was 2 to 4. And then at night, I think maybe it was 6 to 8 or something. And, and we would do these shows for a few years, maybe a year and a half, before we moved into, like, nightclub settings because I was still pretty young we started playing in like bars when I was about 14 um, and it was great because I used to get super nervous um, and I feel like the only way to work through that is to kind of just do it and so I was able to get over being nervous and I was able to learn a lot of songs and able to have a lot of experience and learning experience um, when I was really young which makes it easier I think to get away with certain things with the audience because they're like, oh, it's so cute, it's a child, you know, as opposed to when you're an adult. Wow, so in terms of um, kind of your style when you first started out to your evolution to where you are now, how would you in your own words describe your style? Well, I always, um, I think I've always had sort of this, I, I don't want to say the same, but I've always had a musical idea and a musical personality that I think has has been with me from when I was very young. Like that's one of the first songs I ever sang in public, and I still I still love it, you know. And my my people that I wanted to sound like back then was Dinah Washington, Billie Holiday. Um, those were my two favorites, really. And then with piano, I loved the block chord stuff. So I loved like Errol Garner, and I loved Red Garland, I loved Wynton Kelly, and I feel like those are all still the things that are really dear and important to me. So, I mean, I've gotten better. <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, certainly as you, just as you grow up, like as a person and you mature, you know, little points of view change and even, you know, your voice physically changes. Um, but I think a lot of, I think I'm still, you know, on the same uh, path and toward, heading towards the same goal as when I was little. And with yet within that, do you feel like as you've you know kind of grown through the years, found your own voice? 
as an yeah. artist. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think, you know, I, I definitely feel that way now. I would say the past few years, maybe the past four or five years, I felt, you know, physically, like my voice has really finally developed into like my adult voice as a woman. Um, just the sound, the timbre, and, and finally I feel like I've made some headway with technique, you know, which can take a long time, you know, when you're, when you're to, like wanting to expand range or things like that. Yeah, um, different instruments you have to become very adept at. <laughs> exactly. So I feel like that's happened, and I feel with the piano, I, you know, I've reached a level of feeling comfortable so that I can uh, be more confident trying things or, you know, uh, that I don't have to think so much about the instrument. I can think a little bit more about the music. And I think that takes so much time um, that I'm glad I started early. <laughs> Absolutely. Do you have a, a kind of regimented discipline practice structure or are you more like me? Do you not practice enough? <laughs> well, I definitely don't practice uh, enough these days. So when I was when I was in school, when I was in college, I went to SUNY Purchase for jazz piano. And that was great because that's all I was doing. Because uh, I had done a lot of AP courses in high school, so I tested out of a lot of liberal arts. And I was able to really focus on music. So I was able to practice like all day and it was great. I had all this stuff I would do. I would do all these warm ups, uh, you know, and then I would do transcribing and then I would learn songs and then I would have rehearsal uh, with my band. And that was, that was great. But then since I graduated and I've been just, you know, working and especially the past few years with my touring schedule, it's harder to have like the routine for practicing. Um, since I got, this is actually my new, I still call this my new piano. I got this last July and it's the nicest piano I've had in my house as an adult. Um, and that definitely inspired me to practice more at home or even just play more at home. Um, and that's, that's been really nice. And I've been trying to practice more like during these lockdowns, but it's, a, it's sometimes a little hard to find uh, the creative urge. <laughs> Is that was something I'm going to ask you about too because I noticed you uh, have. I, I was reading on your website, or maybe hearing one of your videos that you're still planning on coming out with a would this be your 13th record, Bird Song? In yeah, lucky number 13. <laughs> so that just blows me away that even in the midst of COVID, you know, with all the just kind of the energy right now on the planet, that you're able to kind of pull within you that motivation to still create and go to the studio hopefully if you can, and, and be able to work on having another album out during. Well, really lucky. Uh, the name of the record is Birdsong, and um, it's actually in production right now. So I just talked to uh, disc makers. They produce my records. It's, it's right. being made today. Um, we recorded this actually back in October in the studio, and then very luckily finished mixing and mastering it, mastering it in February, oh, wow. like, just before everything happened. And then... We've been working on, um, actually we did the photo shoot too, like maybe the week before the lockdown. We just, you know. Good timing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's been being designed, you know, graphic designer Ian's been working on it. And we were a little, like I had originally, the original release date was in July. Um, I think we're going to push it back to August. But I just, I don't want to push it back any further. I think we, we want to release it. I think people will like it and i hope that it'll you know bring some some happiness and something a little bit you know new and fun into people's lives so i i want to to release it um this summer for sure yeah that's great i, I have noticed that that some artists i'm um, like Nora jones for instance candace spring some artists that i i follow have been still releasing music live music right now and i think that's it's challenging but it's honorable because it shows hey we want to get music out even though i don't have the ability to tour it and to maybe make as much money off of it right now it's still kind of a big-hearted move to put music out there for for everyone to listen to during this time yeah i've actually really been um i'm a big fan of Nora jones and i'm so glad that she's like releasing more videos than she's ever released before Yes, that's true. But you're like a paragon of that. I'm not even kidding. Like I was going on your videos on Facebook. I'm like, you go, Tammy. Like you were like the queen of videos, and I love it. And it's such a great way to write. I imagine your fans do they really react well to it? And I, I know some people give like feedback. They're like requests and things. So it seems like they're engaged. It's been really fun. Um, 
So we, we got this we got this microphone. I got this microphone, um, and I've always actually, as soon as Facebook introduced the live feature a few years ago, I thought it was really fun. So we would do it, but it was sort of just like off the cuff, you know, like for you know, oh, I feel like going live today, or we're having a fun sound check. We'll go live. Um, but then after the lockdowns began, um, I think the week after, it, the, things really went fast. It went from like we all had I had all these gigs and everything was happening, and within seven days it was like you know that my five-week European tour canceled July canceled this blah 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 you know and I was kind of feeling you know down and and I thought I bet all my everyone in the world is is feeling this way everyone is like oh now you work from home or you or you're not working um, and I thought we'll go live and and see if it's fun for everybody and it was so much fun and so I started doing those every week and then I thought, well, I can make some other videos during the week to post and share with people. And the response has been great. I get a lot of requests and I've met a lot of new people. Um, I love getting messages, you know, all kinds of things. Like um, I've learned things, like I've learned things about songwriters and, and other piano players and other, you know, new songs. And it's just been nice to sort of still feel like there's a community, even though we're not in person. I'd even say, just from my point of view, this Hannah's Corner wouldn't be happening. I wouldn't be able to, I don't think this kind of interface would be happening without something as a catalyst of, of the lockdown. I think in, an, in a kind of an, in a sense, it's almost forced us to be more of a community and to cling on more to digital and using this interface. So I, I'm just thankful for that because now I'm able to kind of connect with artists like yourself who otherwise would probably turn down an opportunity like this, be busy touring or not really be able to mentor or talk with an artist who's just starting out. So I think it's um, been kind of a blessing in that sense. No, it has. And I think it's also sort of, you know, a, a new time and, and kind of things can happen in a new time, like you're saying, that can't happen when everything is sort of the usual. You know, like I was telling you before we started, before we went live, um, I've really wanted to be a Yamaha artist for a long time and I, I've uh, connected with them and, and you know it just never really you know it never happened um, but after I started doing some of these Facebook lives um, actually I heard from them and they were like oh we saw your videos and you know that's great we'd like to list you on your website would you like to be a Yamaha artist and I was like wow yes I would love that you know um, but so it was kind of amazing that something good yeah, it could come out of this. Wow, that's great. And you always have wanted that. It just Yeah, on. they have a really awesome space here. Um, I live in New York City, the Upper East Side, and uh, the Yamaha Artist Studio is, I think it's on Madison um, in Midtown. I've been there, and it's just, it's, it's a great place, you know, where you can go practice and try out new pianos. They have a recital hall, and I always thought, like, oh, I want to wanna do that. <laughs> you can. That's awesome. That's great. So what kind of advice um, would you have perhaps for young, let's just be specific, young women jazz pianists, kind of like myself and everyone who I've had on Hannah's Corner or just musicians in general in terms of the industry, right? Because we're living in this kind of, even pre-COVID, a very digital time, very fragmented. There's these micro niches and it's kind of challenging I think for artists to make a name for themselves or to become known, if you will, or signed even. What are, what are your thoughts on all that? I I, um, I know exactly what you mean. I certainly had those feelings. Sometimes still have those feelings. I think everybody everybody does because it does sort of feel like there's this machine in our industry, and if you're not in the machine, you're really not in the machine. Like it's the same people who do the big concerts, who are on the cover of Jazz Times, who are on the cover of Downbeat. Not to name names, but you know that's the way it is. Um, and I think it can be very disheartening to sort of feel on the outside of those clicks. Um, but I think, you know, really the thing is it's got to be about the music. And the music is shared between the artist and the listener. And that's when I came to town, that's all I wanted to do was just get some gigs and, and work. Um, and they weren't all fancy gigs, you know. Um, but Every gig can be, every gig is an important gig and, and you can turn every gig into an important gig for you because you can connect with people. And if you have a good audience base and a good fan base that you've created because of your music and because of yourself, 
that's really invaluable. And, you know, that's what's really important. Um, and I think that's what, you know, what we need to focus on really is music and connecting with the audience and just working. And it's not always super glamorous. Or rarely is it super glamorous, honestly. <laughs> it's a journey. And, you know, in terms of, I guess, labels or, or press, um, is that something that kind of happened naturally with you? Like, as you stuck to your path, these things, these opportunities kind of happened? Or did you actively go out and seek, like, a manager, wake up and say, I need to start getting press? Or, like, how did that work for you? Well, I, I sort of, you know, I, I was saying to my family the other day, like, I'm from Oklahoma. And, you know, Okies, like, we get things done, we solve problems, we duct tape things together and we make it work, you know? And um, that's how, that's what I did in, in the beginning of my career. My, one of my first records was The Breeze and I, came out in 2010, I put it out myself. My own label, I paid, I paid for it, my family helped me. Um, and it, it's a great record, I'm very proud of it. And when I put it out, I didn't really have a lot of extra money to hire a promotion or publicist. Uh, so I just thought, oh, I'll just do it myself. Um, so I made, you know, the one sheet and I made a bio and I made all this stuff. And I thought, oh, I'll print everything on pink paper because it's like Reese Witherspoon's character in Legally Blonde. Okay. <laughs> Add something a little extra, don't you think? <laughs> so this, I really did this. I printed everything on pink paper and I sent it out and I spent you know, like maybe six weeks every day on the phone and the email calling uh, radio stations, calling magazines. And I got actually a lot of good press with that record. Um, I think because people were just surprised. Uh, and, you know, you have to know how to talk on the phone and you have to sort of know how to go about it. But I was a little bit, I don't want to say pushy, but, you know, assertive and it worked. Um, and so I just, that's how I handled everything. That's, you know, how I handle getting gigs too. I just call people and say, you should give me a gig. There you go. <laughs> um, they yeah. really don't always, you know, there is a lot of rejection certainly. Um, and then it's gotten a little, you know, it's gotten better of course now with like 13 records. It's, it's easier. People know who I am. Um, and actually I might be hiring I, this year. I wanted to hire a publicist uh, because I'm on the road so much with gigs that I just don't have the time to invest. Um, but I think it's, I think it's kind of dangerous sometimes for young artists to hire a publicist with their early records if they don't have a lot of gigs to back it up. If they don't have a lot of people who already, you know, a lot of audience that really want the record, it can kind of grow you lopsided artists somehow. You know, I think it's important to work from the ground up with with regards to that. But I think. You really have to advocate for yourself, and I think waiting, you know, waiting for a manager or agent or publicist to come along, it can be such a long wait. Mm -hmm, definitely. How did you go about maybe finding your niche? Because jazz is such a broad industry, right? And there's contemporary jazz and cool jazz, and so many different subgenres within jazz. Kind of, did you always know where you fit in in the in the puzzle piece, or was that something that came along as you developed? No, I always knew what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to sing and play piano, basically from the time I was 14 or 15, that was it. I wanted to do that. I've always known what songs I want to do. I've always known, you know, um, basically all the records we've made have been ideas. And they're not all themed, but you know, oh, I want to record this, or I want to do that. I want to focus on this. I'm very lucky, of course, that my father is a jazz musician and he's such a good mentor. I can talk to him about anything and trust him. Um, that he doesn't have like an ulterior motive, um, which can sometimes not always be the case with people in the business. Um, so I always knew what I wanted to do and it's just what I've always done. And people, I think listeners uh, and just people, regular people, have responded so well and like it. Um, but you know, there's always pushback from what I was calling like the machine. Um, I remember with The Breeze and I, I got a, I won't say who it's from or what publication, but they wrote back to me and they said, well, you know, your music is just for old people and we're not interested in that. And I was like, okay, that's fine. 
Um, I will say I've been featured in that publication now, you know, a few times. Well, see, you're from wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you stick around, I think, you know, I think people thought that they could uh, get me interested in doing other things. You know, I had people approach me about making hip hop records. Um, a lot of people want me just to stand up and sing, like, well, why do you need to play the piano? Why do you need to do this? And I'm like, that's okay. You can, like, everyone has an opinion and an idea, but I have an opinion and an idea. And I just, I don't feel, and I never have felt that I wanted to give that up for any reason. No, there isn't a reason. And that's beautiful that you've always known who you are, known your sound. Um, that's something that some people have told me, oh, Hannah, you, you always know who you are, you know your sound. And, and my, my issue is just finding that niche. And I see artists like yourself really rocking a niche, at rocking what you do. And so it's inspiring to me to see that. And of course, I'm thinking, you know, how can I find that place when I haven't even identified it yet, right? I'm just barely growing my fan base right now. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, where, where do I fit in in this big picture? So... Um, it's it's a journey, but <laughs> yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a tricky one because there can be so much, you know, pushback, and everyone has ideas, and and some of them are great ideas, um, and some of them aren't, and you kind of have to just make a decision and and roll with it. And um, sometimes, you know, sometimes certainly sometimes I feel I haven't made the right decision necessarily, but at least I made a decision. You know, at least I I weighed it and I made a choice, and I thought it was the right choice. Um, but I think that's important too, not to just kind of go where people want you to go all the time. Yeah, definitely. And you've also, you've made education quite a bit, you, but you care, it seems like a lot about giving back and, and how has mentoring young jazz art, artists been? Have you noticed just, what have you noticed? What struck you about, you know, young musicians today? Well, I've always really wanted to be involved in jazz education because I grew up, my father was really good friends with Clark Terry. And so I always saw Clark doing, uh, he did a lot of clinics when he was uh, still around in high schools and colleges. And he was very inspiring to people. And I liked that. I was drawn to it and I wanted to sort of do that myself. Um, so I have taught, you know, I've done summer camps and I've done, you know, a lot of workshops, things like that. And I think it's, I just like it. Like I just tell people, if you want to talk about jazz, you want to talk about jazz piano or jazz singing or anything, I want to talk about it. I love that. That's all I want to do all day. I sit all at home and I, I listen to music and I read books and I'm in, you know. And I've I've really enjoyed getting to talk to some young musicians. And now, as I've grown, gotten older, you know, they, they get older and you're like, oh my gosh, I've known this person since he was like 14 or something. Um, but I think it's I think it's really important. I think the music has to be passed down through generations and I've been lucky to have older musicians, you know, be willing to be my friend. Um, one of my best friends actually is Lou Donaldson. I just talked to him like two days ago and he's gonna be 94 in November. Um, and he's just, it's great to be able to talk to him about, about music and about, you know, how I'm feeling about music or about life or anything and just get his perspective and go, oh, okay, like, it's nice to think, you know, I'll tell him something and he'll go, oh, yeah, I used to feel that way. And I'll be like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm not alone. <laughs> you can relate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. What, um, um, do you have, like, a favorite story about a, a, you know, a mentee of yours or someone, in, you know, who uh, you really see has potential or a favorite young mentee of yours? Well, I've been really, I've been really happy. Um, I don't know if you know Oris Jenkins. He's a piano player and singer. He's from Connecticut, um, and he's pretty active on on Facebook. And I don't know, he might be watching right now. Um, but I've just been. He's a great singer and great piano player, and he's really stuck with it. He released a tribute to Nat King Cole last year, and I just thought, I just thought it was great. And I've been so happy to see him. You know, what you really want to see is just that people persevere. You know that they stick around, that they keep doing it. And, and I've, I've been so happy to see that he's still keeping, keep doing what he's doing. And that's the best thing I think you can hope for. Yeah, definitely. definitely to see someone honor their voice and pursue their, pursue their dream. Mm -hmm. Like you said, keep, keep in the game, keep creating content, something you've, you've really shown prolifically with all your records that are out. And that's quite a feat. I, I find it just challenging as an artist to, 
it's like I don't know, and in, in a way, it's like your baby. It's like this this album, and it takes like for me, it's taken like a year to just sort of the conception and the theme and putting it together and <laughs> everything. So I can imagine having twelve. There's probably a story behind every album. Do you have like a theme going in? Do you have a vision of like how you want an album to sound or be at the very beginning, or is it like an evolution? It's all. I would say each one of them has been different. Um, the Breeze and I, which was the, the one I mentioned earlier, that was my one in 2010. It was actually, at that time, it was, it was my third record, but it was my first one to do myself. Yeah. Um, and the, the theme was loose because I had a working trio at the time. I mean, I still do, but it was a different trio then. Uh, Fukushi Tayanaka on drums and Neil Miner on bass. And I just wanted to make a record that reflected that band. So we just picked the tunes that, we lo that were our favorites, that we were working on and playing. And that was the theme. Um, but I've done, um, my album After Dark is the music of Dinah Washington, which was super easy um, to put together because I love Dinah Washington. Um, I did a record called Speechless, which was all of my original tunes, which was something I wanted to do. Um, but it's always like, I don't know, all my favorite people, like Dinah or Red Garland, they made so many records. And that's part of what we love about them. I think, you know, like if you want to listen to, I love to listen to Count Basie, like there's so many records and everyone has their own favorite Count Basie record for their own reason. Uh, so I just felt like as a jazz musician, if I wanted to be like my heroes, I needed to make, make records. Um, and so, you know, yeah, I'll think of a theme and then I'll think of who I wanted, who I want the band to be. We've done live records, you know, so then it's like, okay, we're, I want to uh, make a record in this club or in this venue. Um, and I, it, to me, it's just really fun, and I love to get, but, but I'm kind of like, once I get the theme, or once I get the idea for it, I'm like, let's go, you know? Yes. Like, I'm ready now, you know? <laughs> yep, there's a lot more involved and more delays, you know, the detour ahead, right? There will be de <laughs> detours. Exactly, I just want to get it, I want to get everybody on board, and and with my current band right now, we, we tend to rehearse, uh, not necessarily a lot, but we for a minute there, we were rehearsing every week because we were working so much. So we would just start rehearsing and then it was like, okay, let's set the date. And then maybe a few weeks before the date, decide what the tunes are gonna be and then just go in and record it. And then I wanna like mix it as soon as possible and get the cover up work done and get it out. Because I sort of feel like the longer you take the more ideas you have, like, oh, well, we could have done this, and we could have done that, and it, it slows it down. I have a notes on my phone <laughs> where I just write down, you know, right now I have my, my, my EP that's to be scheduled hopefully for the fall or next year, early next year, and I keep swapping out, like, should it be this tune or this tune, or okay, maybe the next album, you know, and you probably can write where you had, just have, as time goes on, so many more ideas for, like, the ones ahead, so it's... Yeah, you have tons of ideas, and then also... I don't like to make the plan too far in advance because like I change. Like maybe I love this song, but in two months I'm not gonna love it. So let's do it now while I love it, you know, and not wait and then I change my mind. Um, so I, I kind of just like to get things to get things moving. I think there's two records right here. I was gonna tell you this one, um, we just this is my most recent one. It's a duo album we recorded live with Corey Weeds, my friend Corey in Vancouver. And it's great because um, we actually didn't pick the tunes at all. I mean, we had been on a two-week tour, and then we were like, okay, let's record our last gig of the tour, and we'll just call tunes. And it'll just be totally spontaneous. And it was, it was great. It was really one of my favorite records I've done. And the album cover was designed by our friend Takao. Um, and it's nominated for a Jazz Album Artwork of the Year. Wow. Which is kind of cool. Yeah, it's cool. I it, with the Jazz Journalists Association. So I really hope he wins because for that. How oh, cool! <laughs> I'll have to let my Abby know who's doing my it's album. Odd, like it's so it's so odd, right? That's what makes it special. I think I have I can't say I've seen one like that before. It's yeah, really the hands are enormous. Yeah, I love it though. <laughs> so he's he's great. He makes a lot of really interesting jazz illustrations, and um, I think that's cool. So I hope he wins. Yeah. I like that you, you still make records because you're seeing with the digital advent, you know, artists go completely to online. And it's nice, right, to have 
albums because people still buy albums I feel like don't they oh definitely I I mean yes and I think you know like when you're when you're touring or when you're on the working not touring but even just playing gigs I think people like a souvenir um, I even you know I know people order CDs and buy CDs from me that don't even have CD players um, but they just like you know the idea of having it or being able to put it up somewhere um, and then, you know, you can just stream it. Even me, I, I love Errol Garner, and he's been, um, you know, Mac Avenue's releasing all of, uh, not all, but I think they're doing 10 reissues of his music. With They're remastered, and they add an extra track. Um, and I just listen to them on Spotify, because I, I use Spotify. I understand the evils of Spotify, but I use it. Um, but I've still been getting the CDs just to have them, even though... I don't listen to them. So I think CDs are important, and I, I think I don't think they'll go away. I know people are always saying that, but I don't think so. Yeah, I'd agree with you. I, th I think they'll be around for a while still, especially if they're going back to vinyl. If that's in, then CDs will still stay. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's cool, like, because you have a thing you can hold in your hand, and, like, we have liner notes inside. And I don't know, the liner notes are, are really fun. Actually, on my on this record, Birdsong, um, I hired a good friend of mine who I think is a wonderful writer uh, and I, we haven't always done liner notes on the records but I wanted to on this one and I'm so glad we did because the liner notes are really great so I'm excited for people to read them <laughs> definitely now, that's an important part you want to give credit to every where credit is due and a lot of times like on CD Baby there isn't really a spot to highlight everyone who's gone into it you know from the cover art and the engineers to the arrangers so yeah I'm, I'm glad you're doing that still that's great so I'm so excited for Birdsong. Could you maybe give us a sneak peek? I don't know, a little. tell us a little bit about it. Maybe play a song from Birdsong? Yeah, definitely. So it's, um, it's a tribute to Charlie Parker um, because it's his 100, it's his centennial this year, 2020. Um, and it's some tunes that he wrote, like Quasimodo and Yardbird Suite, um, but it's also the jazz standards and ballads that he played. Uh, we do Just Friends, Star Eyes, um, it was really fun to work on this record because <laughs> I love Charlie Parker and I grew up listening to his music a lot. Um, and it's, it's just gonna sound really funny to say, but it's super hard music. Oh yeah. Like even the standards, I hadn't ever realized, but you know, he had such a beautiful sound. I, I know he knew he had a beautiful sound. Um, and he plays these songs that are super rangy like uh, Star Eyes and uh, My Old Flame and even Dearly Beloved, like they have big interval jumps and I hadn't really realized that that makes it hard. Secondly, he evidently loved to play songs that are really happy or even sappy lyrically, um, which I was new to me because I sort of tend to pick songs that are maybe a little bit more melancholy um, and so as we got into the, you know, I, I had made a huge list. I make a lot of lists. So like all these songs, we started narrowing it down. I was like, oh my gosh, these are all really different for me. Uh, and so it was, it was hard. It was really hard music and hard, like even the changes you think, oh, they're not that, they're not that difficult, but then they're difficult to be creative on. Like Dearly Beloved is just, uh, you know, that's Dearly Beloved, da, 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 da. You're in A flat for like five minutes. That's it. I, you know? Well, it's a flat, but then, you know, it's kind yeah, of like, it's just like, I'm like, dang, I'm not, I, you know, make you, you feel like, oh, wow, I'm really not, I'm really not Lester Young, you know? Um, so it was, it was hard, um, but we, one of my favorite tunes, I think is actually the opening cut, um, which is Just Friends, I think is the opening cut. And we did that and we have a really great arrangement that's actually a slow, waltz into a slow four it's a really pretty and i would love to sing a little bit of it for you guys yeah please we'd love a preview <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
rendition. And you just bring such of your own flair to these songs that have been, that are timeless and have been covered so many times. But yet yours seems, it is original. And that's what's really beautiful. I feel like anyone could just listen to you for hours. <laughs> Thank you. That's nice. Well, and that's, it's just a challenge sometimes when you're playing very technical music or mealings that gets very deep to make it come across as so effortless and so relatable, which I think you do really well. Thank you. Thank you. That was a really fun arrangement. Um, it's that cut, the, my, of course, my bass and drums are on there and Scott Hamilton is on there on tenor sax. And um, it was a really uh, fun, I had this idea and I wasn't sure it was going to work, but I think it, it worked really nicely and the guys sound really good. So... I miss my band. That's what I was just thinking of. I love the waltz. I've never heard it like that. It's really cool. I love waltzes, actually. I really love to play in three. Um, my band does not always agree with me. Um, but I really, I just really like to play in three. And I got that idea. I'll just, I'll tell everybody. The, it's not, I'm a big Betty Carter fan. And uh, she had, in, in the 70s, she was doing a bird, a Charlie Parker medley. And she does part of Just Friends in that medley as a waltz. And when I heard it, I was like, that is genius. <laughs> so I just wanted to do it. So we worked it out um, into a nice little arrangement. And it's it's good. Beautiful. I love it. Love it. Great. I um I don't know if I told you, but I studied um a couple of years at U of M with Benny Green. I got the pleasure to work with him, and he, you probably are a fan of his. I imagine he worked with oh. Carter, and you know, same of the idols as you, Oscar Peterson. He got to work with. So, but I don't That's know. No, I'm, I'm a huge Benny Green fan, and and we're friends. Um, oh. I met Benny. Well, I was a big fan, and uh, we met because I started faxing him on the fax machine. We became pen pals when I was living in Oklahoma. <laughs> How many years ago was this? Almost 20. <laughs> Is that almost 20 years ago? Um, yeah, so I had, you know, he had all those, I mean, he has a lot of great records, but I loved those records of his on Blue Note. And then he released on Telark his solo piano record. Um, I think it's called Greens. Greens, yeah, and it has the the image of the five. And um, I just I was such a fan, and I was like, oh, I talked about him all the time. And my father was like, why don't you just call him on the phone? And I was like, I can't do that. And then my dad was like, well, maybe you can write him a letter. Uh, so we called his management agency and asked uh, for like ways to reach him, and they gave us a fax number. And you know, like faxing was kind of a big deal for a while in the nineties. We had a fax machine in the house, so I was like, oh, well, let's fax him, you know? And um, I will never forget the first night we faxed. I, I wrote a letter, maybe two pages, and sent it, and he faxed back like later that night, and I was just like freaking out. Um, it was really exciting. That's awesome. Yeah, he's- Did you study yeah. piano with him? Yeah, I studied piano with him at, in University of Michigan, where I studied jazz piano, and I had the honor to, to work with him and learn so much incredible amount from him just um listening to a technician i mean i know it's insane yeah that is, he's really impressive actually i i've been bugging him i don't know if he's watching so i'm just gonna say it i really wish he would do a facebook live that would be awesome yeah. but let's, let's send a, a group email you know you can send him an email <laughs> you can make a petition no, we I, I see him play you know in new york when he comes through um but he was supposed to be at birdland in april around his birthday of which of course was canceled. And I'm kind of like, I think people would really like to see him play. So I know he posts a lot on Facebook. He writes his, he's been working on his book and so he's been posting a lot of articles and photos, but I'm like, let's have some, yeah. some music. <laughs> well, once things get rolling again, I will say well, there's a new club that opened in Ann Arbor called the Blue Llama Jazz Club. Don't know if it's on your radar, but uh, I know that the owner and the and Dave, who handles the booking, would be thrilled to have you if you'd be willing to come through and do. A, I don't know if you're doing a Midwest tour anytime soon. I would love to. Yeah, I was actually um, supposed to be coming through the Midwest this summer and also in December um, through Chicago and Detroit and and Akron and stuff. So hopefully those things. Everything feels a little bit kind of like on hold. Like we think things are going to happen. Maybe they're going to happen. Maybe they're not going to happen. Right. Um, but I would totally love to come play. What's, um, where does the name come from, Blue Llama? 
So I, so the owner, Don, um, he, the founder, he, this is like a, been a passion project for his and he is, um, his company, uh, Llamasoft, who that's based in Ann Arbor. Um, I think that's where the name came from. He'd probably be able to talk more about the official story, but I know Llama has been a part of everything he's been associated with the word Llama. So, you know, it's very much a theme in the club. We have, you know, t-shirts and hats and it's, it's part of the club. So they have a bit of a New Orleans flair. There was a chef, Louis Garrels from New Orleans, has a real kind of Cajun Creole flair in the restaurant. And it's very intimate. It's kind of like a 1920s, so it's like the blue velvet. It's very kind of demure and, and, and suave. I th think you'd like it's very intimate. And they have a beautiful Steinway they just got from Japan that was just flown in not too long ago. So, And they've only been open a, couple, a few years, so they're relatively new. And Ann Arbor's just been without a jazz club for so long since um, the Firefly Club closed. And they opened, and it's like, whoo! You know, uh, <laughs> even people from Detroit are coming coming over to Ann Arbor. So, What is that, just like a couple hours? Uh, it's about under an hour from Ann Arbor to Detroit. Ooh, it's a lot closer than I, – I don't think I've ever been to Ann Arbor. We've been to Detroit – um, a few times we played the Detroit Jazz Festival. That was a long time ago. We played that in 2011. 2011. Oh my gosh! You're I, that's how long I've been going to it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. It was a great. It was a great year that year. I remember Christian McBride was there with his big band. Right. And we were on the stage. I know Helen Sung was there, uh, and we were on the stage. We played after Sachal Vasandani, I think. Was it the Absolute Pure Water for Carhartt, Maine? Were you down? Yes. It's like a, a kind of an amphitheater. Okay, so probably the absolute waterfront stage yeah. or the pyramid would have been the other one. But. It was really great. I mean, I just remember, like, the people who were running the festival were really, like, they were just really nice, and I love jazz festivals. And anytime you get to, like, go around in a golf cart, you feel very, like, official and excited. I don't know. It was super fun. And I remember the food. Also, the catering was great, which is a big deal. Like, when you're on the road, like... I like to go to the places that have the good food, so. I, I am a foodie. I'm right there with you. <laughs> Better have good food. With all the energy you're expending, you need to refill. So, but yeah, when, when and if things, you know, depending on research or not, we'd, I'd just love to put in a good word and have them reach out um, to you, perhaps directly. We'd love to see you. And that way I get to meet you in person. <laughs> right, I would love that. Yeah. Awesome. This has been so much fun. Thank you for, for being willing to be on my show. Um, as I said, I'm just kind of a starting out artist, really um, value what you have to offer and your beautiful music and um, are kind of a role model to me and um, definitely will be anticipating Birdsong when that is released. So, But I'm really glad that that's already in production. So it's kind of like a done deal, which is good. You don't have to sweat the details as much now, like recording it. So. I think it should finally be good. And disc makers, the, the production uh, people that make my album, they also are making um, face shields, like for medical PPE. Yeah. And I was joking with them yesterday on the phone, like maybe I should also get a box of face shields and I could be like with every CD purchase, get your very own champion face shield. Hey, why not patent that? I mean, <laughs> so you're doing that and you're going to do the, um, the, what was it now, be like a patron for, um, what were we talking about at the beginning? For, uh, for sure microphones. Because I'm in love with their, I'm in love with their MV88. Right. Because I'm not joking. You have the best sound setup that I've heard. And I've been listening to a lot of musicians. It's the most simple because it really is one, it's just one microphone. It plugs directly into the iPhone. Um, I know it's on back order right now. Oh. But uh, it's a great mic. Because uh, you, you've been suggesting everyone, everyone's going on buying it because you have it. <laughs> I have been telling everyone that it's awesome. Even, you know, I have some friends that are um, authors, because uh, I'm a big reader, I love to read, and, you know, a lot of people, they've released these new books and they can't go on their book tours. Um, like Eric Larson, he has a new book out called The Splendid and the Vile, and uh, it's a nonfiction, I, I'm a big fan. And I was telling him on Twitter, like, because I was watching him do book interviews, clearly, like, just with his phone. And I was like, Eric, you gotta get a stand, and you gotta get a ring light, and you gotta get this Shure MV88, you know? <laughs> So I sing its praises. Awesome. Well, if you don't mind, will you just post what you have, um, just the name, the brand of the light and the, the name of the recorder, and that would be awesome. So when and it does become available, we can all get it. Yeah, of course, Hannah, sure. All right, thanks. Well, awesome. It's been a pleasure meeting you virtually and, and talking with you, and hopefully we'll get to meet in person. And for everyone watching, thanks for tuning into Hannah's Corner, and have a fantastic night. Thank you so much, Hannah. I'll see you again. Champion. Have a good night.